Hello, it's Beth Wright and I am providing you a podcast for NUR 236, Unit 5, and this is Chapter 26, Drugs Therapy for Angina, or Angina, ever how you want to say it, it's perfectly fine, it means the same thing. So what we're talking about is angina, and that is chest pain. That is related to a lack of blood and oxygen supply to the heart muscle. And you know how busy that heart muscle is. So it needs that blood supply and oxygen supply. And it causes cardiac ischemia when that happens. And that's when somebody's having chest pain, that's what's going on is they're having ischemia. So we have a decrease in oxygen supply. And that's where that ischemia comes in, which causes an increase in the demand for oxygen. Uh, due to this, can be due to atherosclerosis and car, uh, coronary vasospasms. Um, coronary artery disease progresses from angina to a, a myocardial infarction. So it's important that we get control of that chest pain and um, we got to teach people about time is tissue and when they start having chest pain they need to address it and they need to get that taken care of because the longer period of time that they go then the potential for tissue damage is definitely greater and so time is tissue. So when we're talking about coronary artery disease, we have those atherosclerotic plaques that develop. And when plaque develops, it narrows the blood flow through the vessels and decreases the elasticity of the vessels, which impairs uh, dilation capacity of the vessels. And that results in a decreased blood flow, especially with exercise or any kind of increased workload of the heart. And we have to think about that because, again, if it continues, then it will lead to uh, a myocardial infarction, and we don't want that. So there's three different types of angina or angina, the stable, the unstable, and the variant type. The stable is uh, the pain is usually resolved with rest um, and a fast-acting preparation of nitroglycerin or both. The variant angina is caused by vasospasms often occurring at the same time each day and that can be again relieved with nitroglycerin. Uh, unstable angina or an angina um, usually lasts longer than 20 minutes at rest and often leads to that MI. So we don't want the MI to happen. Okay, we want to avoid that and prevent that from happening. So our clinical manifestations, what you'll hear from patients is they're, they've got a crushing feeling, a squeezing, a constricting, uh, and it's substernal in nature typically. Uh, it may radiate to the jaw the neck, the shoulder, down the left, or both arms, or to the back. So you may have some, um, you know, different types of, of complaints of pain, especially that uh, with the radiating. You hear that a lot. Uh, sometimes people mistake the pain for arthritis or for indigestion. Uh, they may also have nausea, vomiting, diz dizziness, diaphoresis, shortness of breath, or a fear of impending doom. Uh, and if you hear patients say that, um, you need to act on that because they usually that usually means something bad is going to happen. So we need to listen to our patients for sure. Women, elderly, and people with diabetes are more likely to have symptoms other than chest pain. Uh, including fatigue, weakness, and shortness of breath, uh, and the quality of pain may be different. Uh, in other words, they may uh, say they're not having that much pain, but for the average other person, it would be severe pain, especially with the diabetics and women. 
So non-pharmacological management of coronary artery disease is talking to patients about their lifestyle changes, uh, medications that they're taking. If they're obese, they need to work towards trying to, you know, get to a, a weight that's not as hard on the heart. If they smoke, they need to try to smoke, stop smoking. Um, triglycerides, cholesterol, all that needs to be checked out and decreased uh, through diet, exercise, and sometimes medications. Um, if they have an elevated blood pressure, we need to get a control of that. Um, if their blood sugar is staying elevated, we need to uh, work with them on that. Uh, so obtaining a fasting glucose is going to be important to see what that's running. Um, so a lot of education uh, certainly needs to be done with these patients. And the revascularization is a cardiac catheterization, um, you know, that goes in and takes, you know, it does diagnosing, but it also takes care of uh, issues where it, you know, they can get the plaque out and they can put stents in to improve that blood flow and oxygen supply to the heart. So we're talking about anti-angional drugs and of course the goal of therapy is going to be to relieve the pain uh, and reduce the number and severity of the attacks that they have and improve that activity of the patient and the quality of life, uh, de delay the progression of the coronary artery disease and of course prevent the myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death. So pharmacological management is going to be with organic nitrates, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. So you're seeing those again. Um, and then we have uh, the metabolic modulators uh, that are used. So all of these dilate the blood vessels in the treatment of coronary artery disease and, the perif and in peripheral artery diseases as well. So again, the plaque develops inside the blood vessels in these disorder, decreasing the blood flow. And a temporary fix is to dilate those blood vessels to increase that blood flow. Dilation of the blood vessel will decrease the blood pressure. Um, so we have to obviously monitor the blood pressure before and after we give these medications. Your exemplars are nitroglycerin, isosorbides, your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and the ranolazine. That's your metabolic modulator. So let's talk about our nitrates first. Again, the action is that it is, uh, causes vasodilatation, coronary artery dilatation, and arterial um, dilatation, arteriole dilatation. So the use is for sudden onset angina and it's also used for prophylaxis prior to activities uh, known to cause the chest pain such as walking, dancing, or mowing, that kind of thing. Um, and there is a safety alert with the nitrates. Um, because patients can develop tolerance over time um, and it develops with high doses uninterrupted therapy um, and decreases adverse effects and if, if, uh, if efficacy when this occurs and so we have to have strategies there to prevent that prevent that tolerance from happening and so the you know, we we'll want to administer the lowest effective dose and avoid long-acting forms of nitrate if we can. So 90% of patients experience angina will uh, obtain relief within a couple of minutes of taking a sublingual uh, nitroglycerin tablet or there's also the translingual uh, spray. The American Heart Association recommends that upon experiencing angina, the patient rest, that's very important, and take a nitroglycerin, you know, put it under their tongue and wait five minutes. 
If the pain continues after five minutes, the patient should take a second one and wait five minutes. If the pain continues after five minutes, the patient should take a third nitroglycerin and wait five minutes. If the third nitroglycerin does not help, then the patient should call 911 uh, or, you know, you know, try to get to the the hospital as soon as possible. Um, and that does not mean drive themselves. They need, you know, the best thing is to call 911. Um, we need to make sure that uh, teaching, we teach the patient that the nitroglycerin needs to stay fresh. Uh, it should be less than three months old, and the patient will know if it's fresh because it, t it causes tingling under the tongue. Um, the tablets do need to be handy, uh, but patients shouldn't carry them on them if their body heat will decrease the effectiveness. So we need to do really good teaching about that. For older adults, um, definitely vulnerable to hypotension when taking nitroglycerin. So that makes them a greater uh, risk uh, for falling than younger patients, for sure. So we've got to be, again, teaching about that. Adverse effects, they, it can cause a severe headache. Um, and it's thought that with this, the reason is because there's that vasodilatation um, and it can, uh, you know, cause a, a large amount of blood to go through the brain uh, cerebral vascular system really quick. So that's the thought of that. So that, that can be treated with uh, acetaminophen for sure. Dizziness, bradycardia, syncope, hypotension, and orthostatic hypotension. So again, Think about the teaching that you need to be doing with this and also your assessment that needs to be done. So you know, uh, basal dilatation can decrease the blood pressure. So if the blood pressure drops, um, remember that nitroglycerin is short acting. So be calm, stay calm. If the nitroglycerin is removed, such as, uh, you know, with a transdermal patch or if it's going, if you've got it going to IV, then we need to remove it until that blood pressure climbs back up. Elevating the legs should help uh, the blood pressure return to normal uh, quicker as well. Um, we've got to be sure to make sh sure that the patient is on bed rest if that happens uh, to us, if the, we have a big drop in that blood pressure. Um, so also, uh, with the severe headache, I've heard patients say, I don't want to take that. It gives me a really bad headache. Um, so we need to let the health care provider know about it. They can adjust the uh, medication dosage and or, you know, do something with the pain control there. Um, also, the bed rest is important about... Uh, you know, the dizziness, the weakness, and syncope that can occur. Uh, so we may need to, you know, tell the patient, change position slowly, um, you know, see how the medication affects you um, when you first, when they first start it. <clears throat> patient may also complain of a flushed, warm feeling. Uh, and again, the thoughts on that is because of that basal dilatation. Uh, so we need to just let them know about it. Let them know to be expecting that. Also, nurses can suffer effects of nitroglycerin if you get it on your hands. So you need to wear gloves if you're working with this uh, medication. The safety alert. Um, well, you see the contraindications there. Severe anemia, hypotension, and hypovolemia um, is going to be an issue. Um, and the safety alert is um, patients taking nitroglycerin or any other nitrate should be should not be using the phosphodiates enzyme type 5 inhibitors uh, and this is the meds for the erectile dysfunction uh, so that can be a life-threatening situation 
uh, for the patient. So a combination of nitroglycerin and other vasodilators can be deadly. Um, so you might recall from your AMP of the heart, uh, must have a good return to the right atrium to get the proper stretch to pump the blood through the right ventricle, lungs, and the left atrium and the left ventricle. So in other words, your heart is like a toilet. Uh, without fluid in the toilet, it won't pump. It won't flush. Uh, so dilating, uh, dilated, vasodilated blood vessels decrease the amount of fluid returned to the right atrium. Um, the more dilated, the less fluid. So, you know, think about things that may cause a vasodilation like alcohol. Um, and those ED drugs. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, if combined with nitrates, can decrease the blood pressure also. So we got to carefully monitor these patients. So administering the medication, we got to take the vital signs prior to administering any form. Um, and the medication should be withheld in case of a hypotension and um, as well as tachycardia. So we've got to think about that. Um, with, with the ointment, it uh, should not come in contact with the hands and we don't want to do any kind of massaging. And of course there's the IV preparation which comes in a glass bottle and it has special tubing with it. Uh, so that has to all be prepare, uh, prepared uh, when giving them. There's the sustained release oral tablets for prophylactic treatment, transdermal, and IV forms. The um, transdermal form includes ointment that is applied and it describes in the book. Um, the ointment works to prevent angina for about four to eight hours. And um, got to pay attention to, when we're studying pharmacology, pay attention to the half-lives and the duration. Um, the other transdermal methods comes in a prepared patch. Um, the directions are on the wrapper, uh, so be sure to follow those uh, instructions because if you don't then the patient will not get their medicine. Uh, so typically those come with a uh, another piece of film over the medication and that has to be taken off. Uh, that's what makes uh, when you take that off that's what makes the patch stick. So if it's not sticking that means the patient's not getting their medicine. Uh, so be sure to uh, follow the instructions when that happens. Um, for IV nitroglycerin, it is diluted in normal saline or D5W. It's got that glass bottle and special tubing. Uh, it's trit titrated within an ordered range of the patient's response. Uh, so it should be administered uh, via a IV pump and the course patient needs to be monitored on the EKG or ECG and frequent checks of the blood pressure. Uh, nitroglycerin is ordered by uh, micrograms and uh, per minute. So that's uh, the kind of dosage uh, that you might have to be calculating. So patient teaching is definitely going to be um, important for the patients. We tell them to take their blood pressure and um, how to go about doing the every five minutes with uh, when the first sign of chest pain occurs with the sublingual nitroglycerin uh, and you know to be sure to add rest in there. They need to rest because especially you know, they may experience dizziness and syncope and all that. So uh, they need to be resting when all this is going on. Um, 
The ointment should be measured on special paper and placed on a non-hairy part of the body and we need to inform the patient that they need to rotate those sites. Now, isosorbide is a long-term use. It's not for the acute relief uh, and is titrated based on a headache, which is kind of strange, but you know, if the headache occurs then they need to stop and that dose indicates a maximum tolerable dose. So again, it is long-acting. Uh, it has a long-acting dose available and it also there's a sublingual and a chewable form of this. Now beta blockers. Uh, think back about the sympathetic nervous system when we talk about beta blockers. Um, you know that's your fight and flight um, part of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and that increases the heart rate and the force of contractions when we're in that fight and flight mode. Um, and of course you know the heart's trying to compensate when that when that happens. So the beta blockers are used to halt that response uh, and they block that sympathetic nervous system. Um, so they will decrease the rate of conduction through the AV node and they decrease the myocardial contractility and decrease that heart rate. Um, and you know it helps decrease that workload by slowing the heart. It decreases the blood pressure as well. So you know what we're going to have to uh, do with these patients. We have to be careful with the beta blockers uh, to use that with uh, using that with diabetics. Um, the reason is is that a person with diabetes when they have a low blood glucose the stress response is triggered and these symptoms are uh, what lets the patient know the glucose is low so that they can take, an act, take action. Well, if they take beta blockers, then uh, they won't have those symptoms because they're they're blocked. Um, so they won't know when their blood sugar is low. So it's using caution with, with them. Um, if a beta blocker and a va another vasodilator is prescribed together, the beta blockers should be given first due to the side effects of the vasodilators. And then we have our calcium channel blockers and again that blocks the calcium into the cells uh, and when that's blocked then we get dilation and the contractions decrease and the conduction system depresses. Uh, so that helps uh, improve the blood supply, the oxygen supply and decreases the workload. Now our metabolic modulator is the ranolazine and um, this works with the uh, energy of the heart uh, working to prevent calcium overload in the body. Uh, it's first line treatment for chronic angina but does not relieve acute attacks uh, and it does not decrease the heart rate and the blood pressure like the others do. It is contraindicated in pre-existing QT interval prolongation, uh, any hepatic disease, or any with any other drug that can prolong the QT interval. So, what do we got to check? If uh, it's contraindicated in this, then we got to be sure uh, to take a look at that EKG to look at the QT interval to make sure it is not prolonged. Other adjuvant angina drugs, we have aspirin that's often given for the antithrombotic effects, uh, antilipidemias to help with the cholesterol, and of course antihypertensives. Anginal drugs, anti-anginal drugs used in special population for children, um, IV nitro can be used, uh, calcium channel blockers are safe to use. Uh, for older adults, again, we got to watch about the falls with the nitrates uh, and caution with all the drugs with them because of, you know, over time the organ functions uh, de decrease. Renal, we got to have caution with all. Beta blockers are found to actually help renal uh, deterioration of the kidneys, especially with uh, chronic renal failure. So you may see those. Uh, 
prescribed for that. For the liver, uh, calcium channel blockers uh, must have careful monitoring and that's actually contraindicated with your metabolic modulators. So obviously with all of these we have to check the pulse, the blood pressure uh, because of uh, the effects that it's going to have on the body. This concludes your podcast.